Welcome to the Buy Box Experts Podcast. We bring to light the unique opportunities brands face in today's e-commerce world. Hi, I'm James Thompson, one of the hosts of the Buy Box Experts Podcast. I'm a partner with Buy Box Experts and the former business head of the Selling on Amazon team at Amazon, as well as the first account manager for the Fulfillment by Amazon program. I am the co-author of the book, Controlling Your Brand in the Age of Amazon, and co-founder of The Prosper Show, one of the largest continuing education conferences for sellers in North America. Today's episode is brought to you by Buybox Experts. Buybox Experts takes ambitious brands and makes them unbeatable. When you hire Buybox Experts, you receive the strategy optimization and marketing performance to succeed on Amazon. Go to buyboxexperts.com to learn more. Today, I'm excited to introduce our guest, Paul Jarrett, CEO and co-founder of Bulu Group, a subscription service for private label brands. You've worked with brands like Disney and GNC, as well as dozens of smaller brands that have used the service to expand distribution and create higher customer awareness. Paul has more than 15 years of online experience doing everything from working at ad agencies, renting textbooks online, and building his own brands online. Recently, Paul's Bulu Group was featured on PBS's startup program, and Paul today shares his experiences as a keynote speaker, talking about the power of changing your perspective on life and overcoming major life hurdles to become kinder to yourself. Paul brings his expertise to us today, sharing best practices on how brands can leverage the power of online channels to become more relevant in the lives of consumers. So welcome, Paul, and thank you for joining us today on the BuyBox Experts podcast. Yo, thanks for having me on, James. Appreciate it. Paul, I want to start with a very broad discussion point around what do you see having changed over the last 20 years in terms of how brands have thought of the online channel? Yeah, I, I'm, uh, it's, it's fascinating because I'm both, uh, it's the most exciting thing and probably the most frustrating thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I would say, you know, uh, my first website was built, I think about 2003. Okay. Um, and sorry, I have kids and dogs and I've got those two. <laughs> um, so, you know, it was fascinating when we were at a time where, you know, we we're all figuring out credit card payments mm -hmm. and all that other stuff. And, um, you know, Amazon just kind of crept in like a really slow rolling dark fog. Right. Um, and, uh, I, I guess, you know, not necessarily dark, but you know, for people that saw it, I think it was really intimidating for them. And I feel like, you know, there's really just two camps of folks, right? There are the folks that are going to let um, the metrics, the sales channels, the margins, the black and white facts drive a lot of sales. And there's folks that are still stuck in, you know, what's the story, what's the feeling, what's all of that. Uh, uh -huh. um, they all matter, but, you know, when you have a tool like Amazon or you have tools online, there you go, a little more crying for all right. <laughs> um, I feel that way at the end of many days. I know, yeah, yeah. It's getting close to dinner time, I think. Um, you know, it's, it's really a matter to me of who is in charge of the company and what are their kind of like thoughts, feelings, and beliefs. And frankly, I think it's, it's astounding working with who we work with. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we'll still have these multi-billion dollar companies and they're like, we don't want to go into Amazon because it's going to steal sales. And you just, you know, sometimes I stop and I, I, I say, wait, you know, is that serious or is that a, you know, are you being sarcastic? Right. Um, and usually what I do in a room is I say, okay, can everybody just raise your hands if you've received a package from Amazon in the last three days? And sure, people raise sure. their hands and I go, okay, so like, this is what you're missing out on 80%. I believe it's 80% all online sales happen on Amazon. And I think it's just, you know, maybe the most fascinating thing that I've noticed over the past 20 years is the level of denial that yeah. folks yeah. will have, you know, and even now when it is happening and the speed of e-commerce and development is happening faster than probably it ever has overall before, um, we're working with clients and, and, you know, trying to schedule like a quick conversation on, okay, you know, you want to start selling your 
all their excess inventory on Amazon. Let's, you know, go find a third party for you. And they're like, no, we don't want to do that. They'd, you know, rather have it sit around in the warehouse and collect dust. And yes. so it's just, I think that has been really mind blowing is the rate at which technology is progressing is not the rate at which the folks at the top are progressing. And there, a lot of them are stuck in their, their beliefs, um, a lot of feeling, a lot of denial. And, and, you know, it's unfortunate, but also it's evolution, right? Like, I don't, I don't think retail is dying. I don't think things are going to go extinct. It's going to do what it's always done. Business is going to evolve. You know, when TV came around, you know, probably online, uh, you know, television ads were wild, right? When right. people were um, deciding to send catalogs, it's just an evolution. And it's where in that evolution do you want to live? There's no right or wrong. Um, but if you have goals, the right thing to do is to use, utilize channels and tactics and metrics that support your goals. And that's, that's probably over the last 20 years just been fascinating to watch. You know, companies can literally save themselves, but for some reason or another, they're just in denial about using new channels. So your company, Bulu Group, offers yet another channel beyond the Amazon issue. And for companies that may not be ready necessarily to make that step to Amazon or may have already made that step to Amazon. Talk to me a little bit about what your firm does and in what situations do consumers prefer subscription box offerings to potentially going on and, and buying something directly from the brand? Yeah. So the way that we work is we, we historically, and this is changing, you know, due to the pandemic, but historically we've gone to large brands and we said, look, uh, we've been at this subscription box thing for eight years. We mm -hmm. launched our own box. Uh, we grew in less than two years. I think it's about 18 months. We grew to 500K monthly recurring revenue. Mm -hmm. um, we raised about 5 million in capital. Um, our plan was to, you know, never be profitable and to just keep growing. And I think, uh, you know, after about three or four years, that really freaked out uh, some of the investors, right? They were like, whoa, like, what do you mean you want to buy a warehouse and buy all this stuff? And you're like, well, that's... <laughs> That's, you know, our, our, I feel like our fault is that we actually did what we said that we were going to do. <laughs> um, and so, you know, what happened in our industry was that subscription box customer acquisition costs. I mean, when we started, it was literally like eight cents. We could just go post on a message board and, you know, get 80 sales. I mean, it really was, you know, right time, right place, you know, all that stuff. Um, but being the six subscription box of six versus the six subscription box of 10,000 is a very different story. Yes. And so we looked at our business. We did a few things. We, you know, in our spare time, we built a software and sold it. Um, you know, we were really probably year three or four. We were just kind of getting by. I mean, we were struggling. And, um, you know, I just kept coming back to this thought of like, we have everything figured out. The challenge is just, we don't have enough money for customer acquisition costs. And so we said, well, let's go to these big brands. Let's plug in their inventory. Let's plug in the weights. Let's come up with some box concepts for them and just show them like, hey, if we execute this, this is what you can make. And mm -hmm. I think our very first model that we did, we were within, I think, six months, we were still within 3% uh, correct of projections, which was just mind blowing for a lot of folks. I think now we're hovering within just under 10% of projections assuming that the company gives us the correct inventory, correct, yes, movie, yes. Or, you know, whatever. Um, and so we came in and we say, you know, look, we'll do this model. We'll tell you what it is. You can take it, go do it yourself. You can take it, give us, we've, we've identified about eight different services like customer service, website creation, et cetera. Um, we can do all eight services. We can do one of them. We can do none of them. But if you just kind of let us at it, um, here's what we can make for your company. And so we started off doing that. Our first customer was GNC. Um, I think, you know, within a couple of months, they were selling 80,000 boxes. Um, and then our next customer, um, we said, you know, let's really make a list and go after them. You know, we put Disney yes. on the board as number yep. one. Yep. Uh, number two is Crayola. And, you know, we just relentlessly picked up the phone, called them. Um, you know, I had to get on a plane to Disney and pretty much take my way onto campus and, you know, tell them who I was and what I was doing. Uh, we landed all those clients. Um, we built out those programs. And um, that is, you know, really what our focus is. And in the pandemic, though, a lot of companies have really tightened up, buttoned up, et cetera. 
we've done 15 different subscription box programs total, ranging from brand new starting off dog treat company to well-established, you know, Lululemon apparel, et cetera, et cetera. Uh Um, And what we find is, you know, generally the mechanics are all the same, right? The formula we actually have, and this isn't a shameless promotion, but actually on our bulugroup.com website, you can literally pay a thousand bucks, download an Excel file and plug in your numbers and see how your own subscription box will do. Um, It is something that we charge large brands $25,000 to do. Um, but you know, I think anybody with a little bit of a background in Excel and accounting can pretty easily go on, download that file, Uh you know, figure it out themselves. And I would say that's really kind of our proprietary magic is that, you know, we're not going to, you know, start something in three months go, Oh my gosh, we forgot about tape or, Oh my gosh, we forgot about this. Um, we have everything in that model and to go and, and to share that with people, um, you know, and, and to say, here's a new business plan, let us manage it. That's really been kind of the secret sauce. And now we're doing that with smaller companies. And then frankly, in the pandemic, um, a lot of the, like I said, a lot of the big brands have kind of decided to just hit the pause button and see how the world is going. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of the small to mid-sized brands are doing the opposite. They're going full throttle, right? And so we come in and we say, okay, you know, what really are we doing as a company? We're taking multiple varied items with a long shelf life. We are rearranging them. Yes. Um, We are uh, finding audiences that this kind of, you know, what's their headache? What's the solution to the headache? Let's rearrange that box brand, et cetera, for them, right? Um, And let's ship it on a recurring basis. Can be annually, can be monthly, whatever makes the most sense for that audience. Um, And we've been doing that. And and a lot of people have been coming to us and saying, hey, we just need fulfillment on the plant because we're tired of, you know, doing that. And so that's really been the model over the last four years. And I'd say over the past two months, we've been very open with, you know, there's some real estate companies that are, uh, sending one-off boxes to a bunch of their clients. And so, you know, we're taking that on, but the mechanics are all the same. Um, Our warehouse, our software, um, the business model is all built around multiple varied items packed together, shipped on a recurring basis. And really what you find long-term, and I wish somebody would have told me this out of the gate, um, is that we're a cash flow management company and a logistics company. And that's where you see a lot of people kind of get stuck at about 2000 boxes a month is because you have to start making some pretty big decisions. And the way that we look at our company, when it comes to bigger brands, we say, look, this is just another tool in your toolbox. This is great for SEO. This is great for marketing. It's great for research and development all the while, you know, making a profit off of this, not even to mention social media and unboxings. Um, But we do not go in and say, you know, this is the next big thing. We, we simply say, you know, this is a wrench in your toolbox. Now for some of the smaller brands that are just starting, um, it's a similar conversation, but it can be more like, Hey, this can support the salary of a couple of people in your company, but like, this is not the end game. Um, I do, I'm under the firm belief that you cannot run an entire um, profitable growing company off of just a subscription box. You're going to need to do things like sell excess inventory on Amazon. Yeah, uh, you're yep. going to need to do things like sell the box on Amazon. We have a friendship, I can say, with Amazon and we've uh, assisted in their uh, subscription box website. Um, and so, um, you know, that's that's really kind of the, the quote unquote uh, pitch to folks. And I think when they see it and when they concentrate on it and when they put the proper resources, um, it is that thing that can just grow a couple percentage points. And the beauty of it is that you can start going like, oh, hey, we're gonna sell these subscriptions and we're gonna have the money on hand, you know, hopefully before we ever, you know, go buy the product or whatever. And once, once that light bulb goes off in the financial person's head, especially a CFO of a multi-billion dollar company, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of game over and all of a sudden you get really important. So so let me ask you this, Paul, you've explained why the subscription box makes sense for brands. Why does it make sense for consumers? What what is it about getting a subscription box? Great question. Tell me about that. Yeah. 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 So, so this is, this is something that I feel like I have, um, 
I've spent way too many hours of my life trying to define that. I'm a very um, non-emotional, black and white, you know, architecturally minded, you know, mm-hmm. like, what is what is the headache? What is the aspirin? Yeah. And as we we actually helped start the subscription box trade association, uh, shout out to Subta. Um, and that was one of the things we wanted to find out, right? And what we found out in our research is that, you know, when we started, everybody just called them sample boxes. Well, it's really not quite correct. Between Subta and McKinsey, um, you know, they're now labeled as subscription boxes. And within that world, there's kind of seven major categories and seven subcategories. And, you know, I think Amazon has done a great job of, of listing in those out. But there's lifestyle, pet products, um, health and beauty, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And, and within those, there's categories. So let's just take um, men's grooming, for example. Okay. Right? Um, men's gro- Actually, let's take um, vitamins and supplements, and I'll explain why Bulu Box was not a success and why we shut it down eventually. Um, Bulu Box was our original product, and for 10 bucks a month, customers could try um, four to five premium vitamin supplement healthy set samples, um, come back and purchase what they wanted from us, right? Okay. Um, what we found the problem is that people didn't know what to take. So they love to get Bulu Box for about three, four months, right? But the problem was after they were done, they had all these random samples, right? And they're like, well, I kind of like this. Did I take this thing? Like, what is that? Well, I'm not even sure if that fish oil is working, et cetera, et cetera, right? Now, that's what we would call a vitamin and supplement sample box, right? Um, That is great for new customer acquisition. And the business model that eventually was we created our own private label products and we would see, oh, this customer really wants protein. Let's sell them our own protein, right? Okay. Um, nice little business model, but it was a slog and it was like, just not growing. When you have venture capitalists, you know, you got to grow pretty fast. Just wasn't growing at the rate that they were interested in. Now on the flip side, had we been a, um, replenishment box, uh, so a subscription box that says, Hey, every month you're going to get the same protein. You're going to get your multivitamin. You're going to get your fish oil. It's going to be super cheap because we're able to buy in bulk. That is a much more advantageous model. Um, And, you know, there's probably 10 vitamin and supplement companies doing that. Um, And you see people like Harry's come in or uh, Dollar Shave Club, right? Um, They're not giving you new stuff to try all the time. They're saying, you know, take our quiz. We're just going to replenish it cheap. And so I think that's the, the big difference that people need to consider. And when it comes to in the mind of the consumer, um, I would say this, there is um, the different boxes that solve different headaches. The mistake that we've made is trying to define what it is before they get it. Uh, we, one of our most successful boxes is called Lunarly, L-U-N-A-R-L-Y, lunarly.com which was fascinating because BuzzFeed actually came to us with the data. Uh, we worked with Scott's miracle Grow on the products, et cetera. And BuzzFeed said, hey, look, there's these 36-year-old females, um, conservative, um, highly religious, mostly down south and in the Midwest. Um, they want this box based on self-care and the moon and crystals and all this stuff that had nothing to do with the type of person that they were. And I remember just saying, like, what do you mean Wicca? Like the, like the witchcraft type of stuff? And they're like, no, 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 don't say that. That is appropriation. <laughs> I was like, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just failing to understand yeah. conservative, religious, and, you know, like yoga, Wicca, moon phases, right? Um, but what they were trying to explain is, like, you know, their problem is self-care. They're at home all day. You know, they have these different things that they do, prayer, et cetera, but, you know, having a plant to take care of, having a journal, having all this stuff, that really solves a problem because they don't really have a network or a group to talk to. And so um, reluctantly, we went with it. They were dead right, right? Huh. Um, on the flip side, you have stuff like uh, Disney. We launched uh, the Disney Princess Box. We really, even with Disney and their 100-plus data scientists, we really had it narrowed down to um, – parents um, trying to empower their little girls, et cetera, et cetera. Well, guess what happens? We flip it on and grandma and grandpa are buying seven grand worth of princess boxes 
for all their kids, right? Well, we, we made the adjustment really quickly. And, you know, we found out that the problem was um, grandparents had a guilt of not living or being around their grandkids. And so how could they remind them every month that oh, okay. you know, exists, right? And so, um, and I would also say that a lot of the, I would say um, at the risk of, you know, um, giving too much information or kind of like, you know, coming off as inappropriate um, as a company, our customer is not the person receiving the box. And I know that people at our company hate it when I say that. Our customer is usually somebody at a large company that is tasked with innovation. And what's the ironic thing is they usually tend to be risk adverse because they're working at a large company. So I'd say that our customer, we are actually solving the problem of reducing the risk for people in innovation. And we put our neck on the chopping block if this thing doesn't go well. That's really our customer. Now in that process, we're gonna help them identify their customer and sell, but by no means necessary are we coming in and saying, you know, hey, here's exactly who this box will target. We come in and we say, here's who we think it is to the best of our knowledge. All right. It will change once we get the data back. So let's talk about big brands, big companies. T talk to me about the differences that you see uh, working with big well-known brands versus much less well-known brands. How does yeah. it, how does that play out typically? Yeah. So, um, um, big brands are going to be, um, very slow. Uh -huh. There's going to be unnecessary approvals up and down. Um, you know, there's always committees as much as we try to drive it down, you know, everybody's there to shoulder the blame. Um, you know, the, the smallest copy point that the, frankly, like the shit that doesn't matter. Right. Yes. Yes. Um, it, it just gets examined and it just, it just drags on and on and on. And, and you're going like, it just doesn't matter. Like we'll fix it if it's broken. Right. Uh -huh. Every tweet, every social media post just gets a hundred eyeballs on it. Um, and it's kind of like the strongest voice on the client side wins. Right. Um, and so that's, you know, they have all the assets, they have a lot of stuff, but they're just so, um, timid, you know, um, which is, you know, super frustrating when you know what sales can be in a model, but you know, you're having conversations about changing the color of the tissue paper, you know, you're like, what are we talking about right yeah, now? Yeah. Um, you can probably feel me starting to get frustrated with that. Um, I'm guessing the smaller companies are more willing to take risks and fewer people need to make the decision for you to move forward. You, you would think that, um, I would say that that's large in part true. The challenge is they're going to nickel and dime everything. They're going to call you every hour on the hour. You know, they're going to do what, you know, me as entrepreneur, they're going to do sure. what I do. Sure. Right? Sure. So, you know, there's, there's, I always tell people, you know, I think that our ideal client is a multi-billion dollar brand that everybody perceives as super boring, right? Like go find those companies, um, you know, Scott's miracle Grow, right? Um, go find them because they have a lot of the assets, a lot of the everything, but they don't have the, you know, like, Hey, I'm Nike or Hey, I'm Adidas, you know? Yeah, yeah. And those, even when I, you know, I came from the ad agency world for about a decade or so. Um, those are what we would call like the pay the bills clients or, you know, they're, they're, we always would bucket people in the, you know, Disney is like a flagship client for us that we want to brag about, right? Yes. Scott's Miracle Grow is like they're, they're helping pay the bills and yep. then you're not kind of like a bucket of them that you're trying to, you know, get up and coming. So I, I really encourage people to, you know, look for partners that are very big, very quiet and, you know, have the, the tan cubicles when you walk in. Right. So in my world of Amazon, I work with a lot of private label brand owners who use only the Amazon channel to distribute their products online. What sorts of brands at what stages of development should be thinking about potentially using a subscription box as a viable alternative distribution channel? Yeah. So I think as soon as you, I, w I would say this, first of all, um, it doesn't have to be a subscription. That's really important, right? 
um, kits, right? Like okay. how can I put stuff together? Okay. Um, I've worked in retail long enough. I helped a company go from uh, 3 million to 83 million in about two years. And everybody asked me how I did it. And I said, I, I did two things. I took all the leftover proteins, vitamins, et cetera. And I put a little shrink wrap gun on it and I yep. heated it up and sold yep. kits. And um, the other thing I did was just increase the radio advertising. That's, you know, I just did those two things and that was it. So I think that anytime that you're going to have excess inventory, you need to look and think really creatively about like, how can I rearrange this stuff? How can I put it together? How can I sell, you know, um, maybe it's a mystery box, right? Um, you have things that are going to expire. You have to be very honest and upfront on that, but you know, you can, what's better sitting in your warehouse, getting it thrown away, or, you know, are you going to create a, um, one of the boxes that always seems to come up is like a wedding day or like a bride to be box. Okay. Okay. Um, and, and you can kind of come up with these themes, holidays coming up, right. Um, different gifts, that sort of a thing. So I think anybody that's sitting on excess inventory, um, you can rearrange those things into kits, one-off boxes. Um, if you're always going to have overages and excess inventory, um, think about grouping that up and, you know, putting a theme to it. Also, you can call subscription box companies and say, you know, look, um, you just pay to get this to you um, or, you know, cost plus whatever. Or um, some companies, it's like, well, we're going to throw this away. We might as well put it in a subscription box and advertise, right? Um, What's fascinating is, is on Amazon, you typically see brands trying to experiment with excess inventory and they'll sell a three pack where they've never had a three pack or they'll take the blue and the red and the green color and wrap them together and have a skew that's only available on Amazon. How much of what you're doing is excess inventory versus what I'll call, you know, first rate inventory that's otherwise selling by itself. I, when we first started and when we were, you know, kind of, I don't want to say scrap and buy, but when we were figuring it out, mm -hmm. there was a lot of mystery excess inventory. Okay. Okay. Things. Now, as we've grown, you know, there's a lot of premium inventory, but I will say that after, you know, a year or so more of growth, um, we meet with our partners quarterly and we're always pushing them like, look, you know, we got 90 of these, we got 200 of these, like what's, we can, we can create a whole separate brand and just try to sell these things. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of it is, it's nice money for us, but it's just not, you know, enough for them. But I will say that, um, you know, at the end of the year, when everybody is tasked to make some more money, all of a sudden those ideas, you know, kind of come back around um i would loose, say loose change in the couch you can turn into cash i, I get yeah, it yeah yep. and really you know it's like you have the option to pay us to store it or you know we'll cut you a check and yep. eventually they all come around but it, it takes a while so on amazon it's very hard to calculate the cost to acquire a new customer because in fact brands don't own the customer relationship with amazon how do you think about acquisition costs in the subscription box business yeah well the rough you know we take the aggregated data of almost a thousand paying members for the uh -huh. box trade association uh -huh. we have a third party put everything together and give a report and yep. the average customer acquisition cost is about uh, i think it's like 37.99 um so we'll just we'll just call it 38 bucks and how do you how do you look at repeat purchase because the customer isn't necessarily coming back to buy another subscription box from the same brand, but maybe going elsewhere to buy bits and pieces of the parts they liked? Yeah, so in the subscription box, and I think this holds true for the subscription kind of world in general, um, we have the CAC to LTV payback formula. Um, yep. I'm not, yeah, so some people are familiar not, and, and that's, you know, what I always tell people, and I've given a lot of presentations on that, um, the key to the CAC to LTV payback ratio is that you have to define what CAC actually means, right? I've seen folks define CAC as, well, it's when we get an email. You know, I tend to work in a little bit of a, you know, it's when we get paid, like let's yeah. go real yeah. money. Um, and when you start to unfold that, you know, CAC to LTV, you, you really start to realize the customer acquisition cost doesn't matter. We have one brand that um, I think it is a $78 customer acquisition cost. 
Um, the box was selling, I believe for about $40 and over time, um, the churn rate, it just wasn't working out. And so, um, you know, everybody was focused on, um, getting the customer acquisition cost down and somebody said, well, what if we just raised the price to like $58? And I was like, that's crazy. Like, why would we do that? You know? And they said, well, hear me out, you know, this, this, this. And, and I didn't really pay attention because I thought it was a terrible idea. Um, but what we ended up doing was we did flip the switch. We made the product more expensive. Um, and ironically, sales went through the roof. Um, yeah. There's more demand. Um, you know, I think a lot of it was being sold out and people having to wait to come back next month to sign up for it. Um, had a lot to do with it. But again, it just it all comes down to the formula, you know, the CAC to LTV payback. Yes, rate. yes. And that's, that's a big part of that um, um, Excel document business model that I was talking about yep, earlier. Yep. So, so let me ask you, Paul, during the COVID crisis, consumers initially were focusing their disposable income on what I call needs versus wants. Mm -hmm. I suspect a lot of subscription box services would be considered a want rather than a need. How have you had to adjust in order to continue to be relevant so people are spending money buying subscription boxes. I have checked our numbers religiously like every hour on the hour. Yes. It, it, this hasn't impacted sales like at wow. all. It hasn't really, you know, if anything, it's probably given them a little bit of an oomph. Um, yep. I think the longer that we're in it, you know, people are really interested in plants. They're interested in keeping their kids busy. Um, but we haven't seen, you know, I don't, I think what happened was when this thing went down, people scrambled to go buy stuff, but they didn't scramble to go cancel stuff. Right. I mean, like I did, my wife and I did. Yeah. <laughs> just, yeah. yeah that's just how we were raised. You know, you grow up poor, you're like, Ooh, economy's bad, better, you know, just cut whatever we don't, we don't need the Hulu plus no commercials. We'll be <laughs> watch that, right? Um, but I would say, you know, for the most part, um, our subscriptions, are trending i think about five or six percent more than what we thought that they would be at this time and kind of the covid thing is the only thing that we can really put on it so i think definitely there's a mentality of a little bit more like treat yourself okay. and a lot of the boxes that we're launching um it's like you know companies want to treat their employees they want to make home a little bit more relaxed okay also there's, there's still a, they're, they're affordable luxuries so to speak you know you get a 40 dollar box you're not breaking the bank but there is still some mystery in terms of what you're going to be surprised yeah, to find the, the sweet spot for a box is 35.99 which okay. is pretty close to the cac but you know if you're looking at you know the best market right now uh for a subscription box what you want to be looking at is females in the mid 30s range um they're probably already um subscribing to one or two boxes they for sure have some sort of magazine um they for sure have some sort of netflix they're not scared of subscriptions hmm. uh, and tapping into that audience what they usually have is uh two to three subscription boxes um that they're receiving but they're kind of like exchanging them right so i kind of think of it as they're probably spending you know 120 bucks a month 100 bucks a month on various subscription boxes, but they're, you know, they get bored with one and they kind of replace it with another. Okay. okay. Guys on the other hand are like, they get one box and they never cancel it. And if they cancel it, they're just not coming back. Right? Wow. So let, let's, let's talk for a minute again about Amazon. When brands do bundles of their own products on Amazon, we often see consumers buying up a whole bunch of units of that bundle, unbundling it, and then turning off and selling off or selling off the parts for, for, for profit. Yeah. Do you run into that situation where in subscription boxes, somebody has five subscriptions to the same box or is it really all excess inventory that really doesn't have a high street value individually? Um, I'm always shocked at the things that I see on Amazon. <laughs> um, I, I think we just kind of have this attitude of like, you know, nothing we've seen yet kind of competes with us. Um, you know, we're, we're not going to go after people unless the client, you know, asks us to okay. do it. There's, there is like a Disney box that we do that is, um, collector's edition items. And, you know, they have a team that gets after those pretty, pretty well. But, you know, I think 
it's yeah, good luck trying to wrangle the internet, right? Yes. So how do brands balance selling in offline channels with selling box products? Are we dealing with different products in different channels or is it really just different ways to merchandise the same inventory in different places? Yeah, I would say the latter. Um, and I would say that, um, you know, still, you know, a significant amount of, you know, the majority, I don't know what the numbers are now with COVID, but people are uh-huh. buying in physical retail. Um, what we do with some of our companies, um, we'll help write the software where they can um, sell a box in the store and, you know, somebody can take that home or it's going to get delivered to them on a subscription basis or we'll sell a one-off box and on the inside it's like, hey, here's a coupon to go get this, you know, sold to you monthly. Um, we see a tremendous jump in subscriptions for boxes that get into retail. Um, so, you know, it's kind of the, the typical, it's a dog fight online. Um, you know, you're doing what's popular now, Facebook ads kind of feels like it's moving towards podcasting and texting, right? Um, you know, you do that for so long and then you start to, in my, my previous life, I did a lot of physical retail. I did a lot of um, store designs. I did, you know, I was involved with that. And so I know that, you know, the power of if I can just get on a placemat at checkout, if I can just get an ad in an email out to retail buyers, if I can get an insert into the plastic bag, uh-huh. somebody's moving out. Um, the, that Those things just absolutely dwarf anything online that we do. Um, so that's been a big focus of ours, but um, yeah, it's a, you know, like anybody listening, you know, don't worry. It's a, it's like shooting bees uh, with online advertising, right? The days of Google SEO are no more. Um, and I just call them like honeypots, you know, and I'd say, you know, Facebook ads right now is a nice little honeypot. I know there's like a Instagram hustle that kind of works a little well. Um, but it's just, you know, you're just clawing, trying to find the next thing that works yeah. all the time. So we talked a little bit about this at the beginning of our discussion. At Buybox Experts, we are consistently surprised by how many traditional brick and mortar brands haven't evolved their businesses adequately to account for the pressures of online channels. Issues like unauthorized sellers selling their products at prices lower than expected. Do you run into problems like that with some of the brands you represent? where they're selling you products to put in bundles where quite frankly, those products are cheaper elsewhere. Uh, literally the, the phone call I had right before this. Uh, okay. There, there is a, it, it feels like it comes up daily. Um, there was a company that we were trying to purchase um, uh, some sort of foot thing for, I don't know if they're sneaker ball, like sense odor. I don't know. Something to do with shoes. And um, we found them cheaper online and it was the name of the store and everything. And we contacted the store and we said, Hey, you know, these are on Amazon and a few other places and they're uh-huh. a fraction of uh-huh. what you're trying to sell us wholesale. Like what's stopping us from doing that? And they were literally like, yeah, that's, that's not us. And we're like, they're using your company name. And by our calculation, they're doing, you know, probably 15 to 20 K of revenue a month. Um, just Oops. by, you know, whatever. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, well, we've just never been an online company. You know, our focus is this and you're just like, okay, let me, let me walk you through this again. All right. And they just don't care. And I, and I don't understand what, what that is. Um, and you know, we've been successful once or twice, you know, probably the biggest one was GNC. Um, and I want to be careful with what I say, but we were a large part of like, Hey, you know, everybody's selling your shit online. Um, you can go talk to Amazon and get this under control, you know, and um, like instantly you can see their, you know, their, the game just changed for them. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. If you ask them what it was, it was like the whole, like, we don't know e-commerce Well, we're making, you know, we still make some of that money when they sell it. And um, I think a lot of folks just don't realize like how easy it is to, um, manage and run your own. So, I mean, it's not easy. It's just, it's not complex. It's just time consuming, right? I'm going to ask you a little bit of a strange question here. I, I'm, I mean, you've worked with brands for a long time in different capacities. Tell me about a, a big turning point for you when you realized you're good at convincing brands to work with you in whatever capacity that is. 
you know, I'm, I'm sure those early meetings where you went in and were trying to say, hey, I'm dealing with these great big huge brands, why are they going to work with me? But y you had something to say and they gravitated towards it. It's so funny that you say that because like still to this day, people are like, you know, you're, you, you raised 5 million in capital and you, you know, you pretty much hadn't sold a thing or, you know, how do you just like walk in and get Disney, like whatever. Um, and, you know, a lot of people are like, you know, you, you have the, the it factor or the X factor. Um, if, you, <laughs> if, you, if you know me, I don't have a lot of charisma. Um, I grew up in a trailer park. Um, if anything, I'm putting my foot in my mouth all the time. Um, I would say my attitude is simply this. I know that if I contact 100 um, accredited investors and I present to them nine slides and a financial model, I will get one term sheet for a million dollars. And that's just the, the facts, the stats. I know that other entrepreneurs can do it in 10 or 50 calls. So if I want to have three competing term sheets for a million dollars, I need to go make 300 phone calls, right? Um, that stat has held true since, um, this is gonna sound kind of funny, but um, when I was really little, I really wanted to race RC cars. And my dad said, we're broke, there's no way it's gonna happen. Um, what about those cars on TV that have ads on them? Why don't you just start calling those people and asking, you know, if they can okay. put an ad on them. Okay. Car. And, and, and he just kind of, you know, he, he said, if you ask enough people, somebody's dumb enough to say yes, right? Um, given it was the local uh, police department and they gave me a $500 check and I made Great. a little Great. police car. Um, and then, you know, I wanted to play college football. Same thing. I had to get my tape, I think, to 700 different colleges. I ended up getting 12 scholarship offers. Um, same thing happened with my intern. 350 phone calls. I got four or five internship paid offers in New York. Um, and that's just the way that I've kind of always like lived by, right? And so, you know, our close rate is crazy high, but you know, when I go into a Disney, I expect that I'm actually gonna have to go talk to like 20 Disneys, right? What people don't see are all of the people that have slammed the door in my face, yep, yep. laughed at me, yep. told me I'm wrong, et cetera. Um, and I would say that my style is I walk in and I say, um, what, is, what are you trying to accomplish? What's your problem? Tell me about it. Okay, well, I have this thing, and I think that it can solve your problem. Or I'll just find out and say, like, oh, that's really interesting. Um, I have a friend, or I know something, or have you thought about this? And they'll go, like, well, what about subscription boxes? And I'm like, oh, yeah, that, I don't think that really makes sense. I'll tell you what I'm going to do, mm -hmm. um, or I'll tell you what we would do, but like, it really doesn't make sense. And if anything, um, hopefully this was a good experience and just, you know, tell your friends about me. Right. And I think that really blows people's minds. Right. When you're, when you're, um, I think the phrase, you know, seek advice, not cash or money is really strong. So, you know, I'm contacting people and our sales team is to now, and they're basically saying like, Hey, what problems are you dealing with? Um, a subscription box can help solve these five different problems does that align um and our our sales team we we have a a, a saying of uh you're, you're gonna you're gonna f up i'll say f up yeah you're gonna f up 40 calls until you find one yeah yep. that's kind of the stat that we're operating by is that we're gonna get 40 no's and one yes and if you do it enough you might get lucky and hit a couple of yeses um but man my sale is is truly truly just going in there saying you know hey we heard you on your problem we think this might be able to help take it or leave it. When they try to negotiate down, it's like, we don't negotiate with terrorists. This is like, this is what it is. And I would say more times than none, we walk away and we almost like hit our stopwatch and it might be a year. It might be a month. It might be an hour, but like they always come back because what we presented them is a problem solver. It just depends if they're, you know, um, um, if that's the correct time for them. I will also say that I probably have an unhealthy obsession with personality profiles. Um, you know, that, you know, the, the Carnegie, how to win friends, family, whatever that yes. one is. Yes. Um, you know, I actually have like a, a document of notes. And so I'm definitely trying to figure out, I'm a real big fan of a website called Crystal Nose. 
It's Crystal and then K-N-O-W-S. It's um, artificial intelligence um, software. You plug it in, you can go to LinkedIn, look up anybody. It literally tells you how to talk to that person, right? Um, and you know, you can understand, should I be direct or should I ask whatever? But I would say approaching people based on who they are, trying to figure out what problems they're trying to solve. If it makes sense, I share with them what we have. If it doesn't, I try to help them go solve those problems. I have more people in my inbox that have nothing to do with subscription boxes that I'm helping solve problems for. Yes, yes. And then they always go, you know, oh, oh, hey man, like, how can I help you? And I'm like, oh, well, thanks for asking. You know, if you know anybody that is looking to do a subscription box, just tell them to drop me an email. That's all I ask, right? And that strategy has seemed to work pretty well. It's a slow strategy, but once it starts to get going, then it's, you know, it's very um, um, word of mouth, right? Paul, I, I want to make sure before we finish our conversation, I, I want to... Uh, pay credence to some of the stuff I've, I've heard you, you talk about in the past. You have a lot to say about mentorship and advice that people have given you around being good to yourself, being good to the world. T talk to me about that and, and how you came to be in a place where you're so self-aware. Yeah. Well, I think when the moment you start to think that you're self-aware, it kind of escapes you, right? Um, I think actually this COVID crisis, I think a lot of people need to um, reacclimate, readjust, understand who they are in this world versus the world before. Um, I think, you know, you're going to be a very different person, but I would say, you know, really I can kind of trace it back to a key moment of, um, and I'll, I'll give you the short version of this. I have a, a longer, uh, uh, slightly more emotional version on YouTube somewhere, which I did not know somebody was going to post the presentation. Um, but I would say this, about three years into the business, we're winning awards, we're growing, everything is going correctly according to the world. Um, to me, I'm still there Sunday morning on my computer going like, oh, are you kidding me? What the hell? Like, how did they mess that up? You know, just like right. every little thing. I was just so frustrated with my wife comes out and she's like, what are you, are you talking to yourself? And I remember I thought, I'm not, I'm not talking to myself. There's, there's, what do you mean? You know? And she goes, well, what, what, she is actually, let's, let's go for a walk. You need to take a break. So we're on a walk and she goes, uh, well, I heard you cussing at your desk and I've noticed when you work out, you know, there's a lot of like F bombs and there's mm -hmm. like, it's mm -hmm. like you, literally we walk into a gym and your demeanor just changes to like kill, kill, kill. And I was like, well, that's how I was raised. I played football, you know, like that's, that's, you know, from, you know, in Nebraska, you start off in like first grade, you know, that's yep. like your car. Right? And she said, well, you know, what, what you're saying to yourself, like, what is that? And I really didn't understand what she was trying to say to me. And she goes, well, let me say it like this. Would you ever talk to your little sister the way that you're kind of talking to yourself internally? And I was like, no, no. She goes, well, would you talk to me like that? And I was like, no, 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 no way. You'd be gone in a minute. She goes, would you talk to your mother like that? And I'm, you know, I'm really tight with my mom. I was like, no, absolutely not. I would never. And she goes, and so when you're doing these things, like you're running a marathon or whatever, your thoughts in your head are, you know, not good enough. Are you effing kidding me? Like, yep. Yep. And I was like, yeah, wait, are yours? And she goes, no. She goes, so why are you treating the most important person in the world like shit? Yeah. And it took me a moment and I was like, oh, and I just, I just collapsed. I never cry. I was like sobbing. I was like, what? I'm, I, I literally I go, do I have the flu? Am I sick? And she's like, no, you're feeling emotion. Like you're like realizing that your entire life, you've just been beating up on yourself for, for nothing. And I'm like, wait, you don't do that? And she goes, no. I go, well, what do you say? And she goes, I say, good job. You know, uh, keep going, uh, give it your all. And, and I remember I go, F you, people think that. And she goes, I think the majority of people say that to themselves, but I think there's a, there's a breed and, and I kind of think it's about 30% of the population, um, where you're, you, you've for whatever reason experienced something, um, where it's just not good enough. And I think that same sort of person tends to be the entrepreneur, the CEO, that sort of a person. And, and I will just say this to those folks, like I was on that side. Um, I get it. Like I get it. I understand now 
on the other side of that, the abundance mentality and seeing that my wife's family, they're all successful lawyers, doctors. There's a national championship quarterback in there. There's a Tom Osborne, the great coach in there. Uh, there's a nephew that's a quarterback at Nebraska or wherever he's at now. Um, you know, her whole family kind of up and down. They're all really polite, positive, happy, happy mm-hmm. people. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, not a lot of them are in like leadership roles, but they, they're wired that way. And then as I started thinking about the investors that I had encountered, I was like, wait a second. There are these investors that have happy family lives. They're wealthy. They're successful. Um, they're not assholes to people. They're not, you know, whatever. They're not micromanaging. I want to go over there because that looks way better than whatever I'm doing over here. Um, And then I remember, you know, to make a long story short, I remember I Googled and I think the first thing I Googled was like what you say when you talk to yourself, like how to fix that, you know, whatever Opened this whole world of like, you know, neuroplasticity. But the first book was literally what you say when you talk to yourself. It was written in 1975. Um, That Saturday Night Live, Stuart Smalley, uh, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, gosh darn it, people like me. That is literally from this book. This book was not intended to be a self-help book. It was intended to be uh, basically the, the, the the whole concept of the book is whatever you input is what is gonna come out. So for example, if you're like, hey, I'm bad with names, I'm sorry, I'm bad with names, I'm bad with names you're going to mess up names and your brain is going to say, Hey, we did what you said that we were supposed to do. Right. And that really, I mean, it just changed everything around. Um, you know, I would say for some of our employees, they struggled a little bit. I think we lost a few of them because they kind of like the micromanager, you know, whatever, but it was, it was almost within probably about a three to six month period um, that everything just changed. The business started growing. Um, and, it, and it's just that abundance mentality. And I still find myself falling victim to, you know, some negative inner dialogue. Um, but, you know, there's a few tricks that you learn like, okay, is this the truth or is this just what I'm telling myself right now? Is this the false narrative that I've got locked up in, right? Um, and I think sharing that message and when you find those entrepreneurs, and I'll tell you, when I give this presentation, it's much more succinct. I warn the audience. I say, a few of you might break down in here. A few of you might have to get up and go, but about 70, 75% of you are going to go, what is this guy talking about? And every time without fail, there's about three people that get up. There's a couple of people afterwards that are sobbing and they're like, I, you know, I didn't know that was me. Um, And so, you know, I just really encourage people to like, be careful with, what you're putting in. I also look at some of the Amazon stuff, um, for sure a lot of the startup stuff. I think online, um, you know, I forget who coined the phrase, there's a professor at MIT that I was working with, but he said, stay away from the business porn. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> what, what do you mean? And he goes, the business porn. I'm like, I have no idea what that, mean, that means. And he goes, that's, uh, that's when you just read about angry birds blowing up, but you don't realize they've been around for seven years. That's the people that are making, you know, a gajillion dollars doing something, but you don't realize they have three failed businesses there. You know, be really cautious of what press releases you read, read in between the lines. And I'll tell you, like having, removing crunch base, removing a lot of those, you know, Inc. 5000, you know, all those like, you know, really shiny stories, removing that from my diet and changing that to just, you know, what are the hardcore evidence or frankly, just like giving time to myself to think freely about the business. That has been a massive change. And had I still been locked up in that thought, there's no way that our business would be, be able to develop and grow because one of the things that I really came to understand about myself is I was absolutely not trusting people to do their jobs. And when you trust somebody to do their job and you truly, truly trust them, um, magical things happen, right? Um, when you trust yourself to hire people that are way smarter than you are. Yes. Yes. Uh, when you, you know, when you, when you do those things, all the things that you might read about or whatever, um, they're hard to do, but when you have the abundance mentality and when you, um, have positive self-talk and you're just like, we're going to figure this out, teamwork, you know, et cetera. Um, it's, 
absolutely mind blowing the the difference in quality of life that you can have. And it's not easy. Um, and it's just like anything, you got to work at it, right? Paul, I, I very much appreciate you being so open with us today. I thank you for joining us. For those of you interested in learning more about Paul's subscription box service or his uh, guest, guest speaking opportunities, please visit bulugroup.com. Thanks for listening to the Buy Box Experts podcast. Be sure to click subscribe, check us out on the web, and we'll see you next time.